How's it going guys? I am Josh. I did my first ever adult gymnastics lesson today. I cannot feel my arms and we are going to learn landscape photography. Now this is my favorite subject in the whole photography arena so I'm super stoked to teach it. We're going to start off with a little bit of theory followed by the equipment that I'd like to recommend then the actual technical settings on using full manual to shoot some banger landscape photos and lastly some Lightroom tips and tricks. Now if you're a beginner photographer you're in luck because this tutorial is for you and if you're a little more advanced you'll hopefully still learn some awesome stuff from this and you should still just check out my photos to make sure you like what you see before taking my advice because I wouldn't want to listen to someone whose photos I absolutely hate. Also in the comments down below there's going to be a directory so you can skip to the parts of the video you want to watch now whether you're a little more advanced and only need to know certain things or just highly impatient. Also if you like what I'm doing be sure to subscribe and hit me with that follow on Instagram. That being said let's get going with what is landscape photography? Most simple answer is really nice photos of nature, typically without people, where you're manipulating your camera and your surroundings to make everything look as beautiful as possible. Among many other things, this includes messing around with long exposures, waiting for optimal time of day for the most dramatic, impactful lighting on a specific scene, and some Lightroom post-processing to make things look particularly sick. Landscape photos are mostly in the nature photo family alongside wildlife photography and some crazy macro stuff of flowers. Now there's also urban landscape photography but for today's video we're going to be focusing mostly on the great outdoors. What you're going to need. I've seen a lot of tutorials where they're like yeah just casually pull out your 20 grand in equipment. I'm not going to be that guy. Some basic things you're going to need. A DSLR or any camera with basic manual settings where you can adjust the aperture, shutter speed and ISO and a tripod. For cameras, I'm a big Canon guy. I'm using the Canon 70D right now. Might be upgrading to a full frame camera. I've been renting and messing around with them recently. However, if you're looking for something cheaper, I would recommend the Canon T5i. It's got a flip out LCD and it's one of the cheapest cameras in the Canon family. That still packs a punch. And I'm gonna be putting a link to all the equipment I mentioned in the description down below. For tripods, I use two things. One, this Manfrotto B Free, and it's a super lightweight travel tripod that fits nicely in this bag. And something I should point out, photo tripods are very different from video tripods in that the head can actually swivel around, which allows you to take landscape and portrait photos. Landscape being like this, portrait being like this. And they're super helpful, and I've used a video tripod for photo for the longest time, and I'm so glad I finally upgraded to this guy. Highly recommended. Very light and still effective. And this guy is the ultimate lifesaver. I always have the Joby Gorillapod in my backpack because it's super light and sometimes it actually gets you in places that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Like on top of a tree branch, this guy is amazing. And it's super lightweight and it fits in a backpack. So this is really great when you're doing a 10 mile hike. Now you won't always need a tripod for landscape photos, but I shoot probably 75% of mine with a tripod. It opens up a lot of doors. So we're gonna keep that on the crucial list. Another helpful but not crucial item is the intervalometer and what this guy does is it plugs into my camera and I can use it as a remote. Now the reason why I want to do that is because when you press the shutter button on your camera it's going to shake the camera a little bit. If you've got a fast shutter speed not a big deal but we're going to be messing with some slower shutter speeds. Now if you don't want to spend the $19 to buy this guy you can also just set a two second timer delay on your camera which is really nice so that any sort of shake evens out. However, the reason why I like this guy is because one, you don't have to touch your camera at all and sometimes, especially with the Gorillapod, I keep my camera in some dangerous situations where I don't want to touch it at all. And second, you can adjust the shutter speed on this without having to touch your camera, which is awesome for HDRs and just again, not having to touch your camera. And also time lapses, so not a bad investment for $19. And finally, let's talk lenses. You can shoot landscape photos with just about any lens. However, one of the most popular landscape lenses is a wide angle. Now the reason why is because you're probably going to be shooting these very wide sweeping landscapes and the wide angle is great for capturing that. And second because they have a much wider depth of field which means it's much easier to have everything in the shot in focus with the wide angle. So when you have those close-up rocks in the faraway mountains everything is going to look sharp in focus and beautiful versus a telephoto or super zoomed in lens where it gets a little bit more complicated. So yes the wide angle is excellent and I use a Tamron 10 to 24 millimeter wide angle 
Links to all this stuff again down below. And lastly, filters are a huge thing in landscape photography, but again, one of those things that you shouldn't invest in until you know you're into it. So I have a whole video about buying your first filter and suggestions for neutral density filters, graduated neutral density filters, all of that great stuff. Link to that right over here and on to actually taking some photos. Step number one, get to your location, which is honestly half the battle in landscape photography, just having these awesome spots to shoot. Climb a mountain, wake up for sunrise, wade through a lake, or do all three at the same time if you really wanna make things difficult on yourself. I do most of my landscape photography in national and state parks in the US. However, if you aren't able to take a road trip right away, you're blowing it, no. Go look up the closest state park to your house and make it out there and start exploring because there's amazing stuff in every state or country or universe. Step number two, timing is key. If you know what nature elements you're gonna be seeing throughout the day, you can really plan it out for the best possible photos. Wide sweeping views or anything with the sky is probably best for sunrise and or sunset, depending on what angle you're at. There's a lot of light snobs in landscape photography and for good reason. So just for a quick example, this is the same exact photo I shot midday of Mount Rainier in Mount Rainier National Park and this is the same shot at sunset. But realistically, unless you live in Utah where your whole freaking state is one big national park, you're probably not gonna be able to get to choose where and when to shoot each photo and you just have to take what you can get. So what I recommend you do is shots with the sky, sunrise, sunset, and then during the day, find some water. So lakes, rivers, waterfalls, anything where it's just all of that and a little less sky, great for during the day. And also do some hiking while you're at it because you're probably in some really beautiful nature. Step number three, once you find that beautiful location, you got your sick waterfall, your beautiful mountain, whatever, that's cool. You're gonna have to find a foreground element to step it up. So what I mean by that is something to balance out this cool thing in the backdrop to add a little bit more interest to the photo. Anything to add some compositional elements balance, leading lines, framing. Don't be afraid to walk around the scene and just keep looking for something, whether it be a cool tree or an awesome pile of rocks to do that for you. So a couple examples, lakes make for really great reflections and that adds automatic amazing symmetry to a photo. If you have a waterfall, see where the river runs and try and have that nice leading line out of the photo. Also roads and rivers can sometimes be great leading lines. Also look for some interesting trees or flowers to put in the foreground just to add a little bit of balance. Also negative space can be a really cool thing to play around with, so feel free to get creative and mess around. A great photo could have a bunch of these compositional elements going for it, or just one or two done very, very well. So it's really important to experiment with both of these things. A complicated photo with tons going on, and just a really simple one where you just nailed that one thing. Step number four, positioning. Now that you've got your foreground and your background element, and you take your camera out, pop it in full auto if you're not comfortable messing around with the manual settings yet, and just start to frame up your shot. So a couple things to consider, try backing up away from it, get a little bit closer in, zoom in and out with your lens, and mess around with your own height. Get your camera up super high, get it super low to the ground, which is always a good thing if there's some interesting rocks or something. Just play around with it until you have a general cool composition. Step number five, some preliminary stuff. A, man up, put your camera in full manual. Don't worry, I'll be walking you through all of these settings in due time. B, make sure your camera is on raw mode because it's gonna give you way more editing capability in post-processing. C, just turn your white balance onto auto or cloudy. Either one is fine, just don't worry about it too much. Because we're shooting raw, we can play with that again in Lightroom. D, plug in your camera remote or turn on your two second shutter delay. E, turn on live view so you can look through the screen and see what your camera is seeing if you have it. And F, pop your camera onto the tripod because we are gonna go big time now. Even if you think you don't need a tripod for this shot, use one anyway. We're gonna be messing with all these manual settings and it's really nice just to have your composition fully locked down so you can really focus on one thing at a time. Step number six, setting your aperture. Now, as I love to remind you guys, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO all counterbalance each other. So you have to pick which one is most important to set first. And aperture is gonna be that for landscape photography. Now, the reason why is because a big part of landscapes is having everything sharp and in focus from the very close up rocks to the very far away mountains or whatever. Now, a common mistake here is thinking, I want a very, very wide depth of field meaning everything is in focus. So I'm gonna turn my aperture to F22, which is the widest aperture. That's actually a bad idea because after a certain point, there's this thing called lens diffraction where it stops to look as sharp on your lens. And the sharpest point you're gonna get is usually around F8 to F11. So let's just start by setting our aperture at F8. 
eight. Step number seven, we are now gonna set our ISO all the way drop into the flow at ISO 100. Now the reason why is because we are using a tripod so we have tons of flexibility and we might as well minimize the noise of the image. Especially because one, you might be doing prints of these shots and it looks much nicer when you have lower ISOs. And two, we might be doing long exposures in which case lower ISO numbers are very helpful for this. Step number eight is now setting the shutter speed and since this is the last of the three, we're just gonna set it so that the shot is properly exposed which just means that it's properly lit. So if you're looking through live view, it might look a little bit different than when you actually take a test shot. So be sure to base it on test shots. Say it's twilight hour, it's pretty dark out. I would start with a very slow shutter speed of say 1 30th of a second and then experiment from there. Make it slower if the shot is too dark, faster if it's too bright. If it's already really bright outside, say middle of the day, start around 1 250th of a second and go from there. Now you're probably gonna notice to properly expose the sky, you're gonna have everything else in the foreground be a little bit too dark and vice versa to have the properly exposed foreground, the sky will be blown out and too white. To fix this, you can use filters or HDR composite images, more on these later, but for now, just set a shutter speed that's right in between the two. So you have the sky a little bit too bright and the foreground a little bit too dark right in the middle and we'll fix it all up in Lightroom later on. Step number nine, focusing. Now focusing is a really important part in a proper landscape photo where everything is sharp from the very close up stuff to the far away subjects. And the trick to this is this thing called hyperfocal distance. So there's some fascinating math and science behind hyperfocal distance, but basically a quick rule of thumb is take the closest object in your frame that you want to be in focus, approximate the distance between your camera and that object, double that distance and focus to that point. So say you have a rock that's 15 feet out from your camera, double it 30 feet and focus 30 feet away with your camera. So doing that will give you a photo where everything is acceptably sharp from that rock all the way to infinity focus. Now the wider your lens, the easier this becomes, which is why people love wide angle lenses. And you're probably just gonna use a focus close to straight up infinity in your wide angle and not have to worry about it too much. If you're using a more zoomed in lens, then hyperfocal distance really comes into play. But honestly, for most of my photos with this Tamron 10 to 24, I just have it straight up at infinity or a little bit below, closer to 10 feet. Super, super easy. If you're curious to learn more about hyperfocal distance, I'll put a link to an article down below there's a really cool, very technical side of photography that a lot of people overlook that's actually pretty fascinating. And step number 10, get creative. At this point, your shot is all set up, and I know that may have seemed like a lot of stuff, but in due time, it'll be pretty second nature and easy to do. And this is when the experimentation comes into play. So a couple ideas on improving your shot. A, refine the composition. Look around the edges of your photo frame and see if there's anything that should or shouldn't be included. Because it sucks to have something that's just peeking in. You should either have it fully in the photo or fully removed from it. See if you should zoom in or zoom out with your camera or move the camera closer or further away. Also, try moving the camera way higher, move it way lower to the floor. If you're having trouble with finding something cool in the foreground, you can always just keep your camera really low and use some interesting texture on the floor. That's always pretty good. B, think about the rule of thirds and the ratio of sky to land. Do you want it to be 50-50 or to be more interesting if you had two thirds land and one third sky or vice versa, really just depending on where all the action is. C, give the scene time, let the clouds roll in or roll out, let the sun settle a little bit more, let it go into blue hour where twilight is super awesome. This is actually an example of a sunset versus blue hour photo, and I think the blue hour photo turned out a little bit better. So be patient, hang out, enjoy nature, and see how things play out in your scene. D, filters, as you guys may know, I kind of shoot like a dad in that I love filters. They make landscape photos so, so much better because with a 10 stop neutral density filter, you can actually have all the water be flattened out and smooth, have the clouds be dragged out and look awesome, and that's always a really fun thing to do. Also waterfalls, any, any sort of water looks awesome with these guys. And again, more information on filters in some video links down below. And E, you can also mess around with HDRs or composites, though personally, I think they don't look too great, and I usually just aim to use graduated neutral density filters instead. Again, watch the filter video. 
if you want to know what that means. And step number 11, the editing of these photos. Editing is super key for landscape photos because you can bring out a lot of stuff and fix up some big problems that you had. So if you don't have Lightroom, I highly encourage you to download it. I'll put a link to get it down below and it starts with a 30 day free trial and I think you might fall in love. I use it for editing all of my photos. A couple of tips for getting those bangers out of Lightroom. One, mess with the shadows and highlights in your photos always because you'll find that you bring out a lot of information that you otherwise would not have seen. Two, bump up the clarity and the sharpness. I like to bring my sharpening amount to about 100 and then the noise reduction luminance to about 25. Now, something to keep in mind with clarity is you gotta be subtle with it. It's tempting just to bring it super way up and make a crazy looking image, but I try and keep it below about 40 because otherwise it starts to look a little bit too gnarly. And three, to fix that too light of a sky issue that we had earlier, what you do is you edit the photo just thinking about properly lighting the foreground. So don't worry about the sky too much. Don't worry if it gets blown out in the editing process. Then what we're gonna do is open up an adjustment brush. Just hit the K button on your keyboard, should also do that, and select only the sky. So with that, we're then gonna play with the shadows, bring them down just a little bit, and it'll darken the sky just a nice subtle amount. I'd bump up the clarity a little bit more and the contrast to make the clouds pop a bit. Sometimes I bring up the saturation just a little bit. This whole adjustment layer will allow you to independently edit the sky and still have the properly exposed foreground, making for a beautifully balanced image without having to go crazy on the HDR action. And finally, you're gonna wanna mess with the HSL top a little bit. I always play with the saturation and the luminance of all the prominent colors in my photo. So if you take a sunset photo and there's a lot of purple in it, you gotta play with the purples, see how the hues will mess with it, and get it nicely tweaked to your liking. Those things among just tweaking with anything and everything in Lightroom will help you make for a much better photo. And that is a quick overview on some of my favorite parts of the editing process to get those banger shots. What a bro thing to say. And step number 12, post your best shots on Instagram with the hashtag Josh Katz photos and tagging me at Josh Katz because nothing would make me more proud than to see some ridiculously awesome landscape photos from you guys. And also because I'll be featuring my favorites in my next photo tutorial coming very soon. So my last photo tutorial, I did astrophotography and I wanna give a quick shout out to these three people whose photos I really liked. Jesse Buxton, this is incredible with the moon over here. Kind of astrophotography, just really sick shot. Duke of Photography with this nice star trail situation going, and for Mamba, which is a classic, nice photo. A little bit of subtle Milky Way action there. Very well done, guys. It is so sick to see you guys having success through my tutorials. And if you want to see my astro photography tutorial, link to that right over here. For more photo tutorials, prints of my best shots, and frame prints coming very soon, as well as reviews of my entire camera setup and more of my photos just in very high resolution, be sure to check out my website, joshcats.me. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to have my content coming at your face more regularly. Lots more photo videos coming very soon, and I also do live streams where I review your photos on the spot. So keep an eye out for all of that amazing stuff, and give this a thumbs up while I'm asking for everything. And that is all I have to say. Thank you so much for watching. Happy shooting. Cannot wait to see what you guys do. In the meantime, I will see you eventually. I'm gonna go cook Mexican food with the homies. Also, any questions, comments, ideas, requests for future photo tutorials, leave a comment down below. There's normally a really awesome community of photographers answering any questions people have, and I'll try and answer some stuff myself. So yeah, any curiosity, comment section will be amazing, hopefully.